Thank you. <laughs> How you? was your trip back up north? It was fun. It was easy. Okay. Good. It's like good. A 40 minute flight. Yeah, it's not, not bad. It's like me popping down to Florida. I could do it for a weekend and yeah. I love it because I have family down there. So yeah, it's really cool. Good stuff. Well, the Newark airport is a lot different than the Burlington airport. The Burlington airport, you just get there like four minutes before your plane takes off and you just like, <laughs> seriously, oh no, we have to yeah. do the TSA and the da 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 and yeah, changing gates. They did that to me last time I, I went somewhere. I was going to Alabama for a meeting and I'm like, I'm early and I'm waiting and everything. And then I look up, I'm like, why isn't like nobody else is here? They had changed the gate. It went to another one of the little thingies. I'm like, shoot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Ethan, do you know if, is Andy joining us tonight? He said he wasn't sure if he was going to make it. Okay, no problem. So just yeah. so you know how we, how we work this, there's um the slide that you see this just, uh, I think I'm, I'll show it to Andy too at the same time. Cause I just little updates. We, you know, talk to people about our upcoming programs. We're mentioning the walk in the woods. All right. Yep. See Andy, that's actually up on the website now. So people can register. We have. One person for the first date and surprisingly six for the second. I thought Saturday would have been booked quicker. Hmm. All right. So they can register online. All right. So top of the, or somewhere on the website, front page. Um, Andy's going to make every single person that is a, on this webinar that's not a member to join. Yeah. yeah Got it, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. <laughs> and then I just say, you know, we're the, we used to have, we did a Hudson farm event. So we were calling them the Hudson farm tapes. <laughs> yeah. So, so these are the annual meeting tapes. So, and then I'll stop this, start the, uh, hopefully the, um, the recorded presentation, which by the way is 40 minutes. Um, so we'll let that go. Ethan, were you thinking of just letting it ride or did you want to stop it at certain points or? No, I'll just, I'll just, we can just watch it and then I'll just do a QA and a after. Perfect. Okay. And so usually how we work our Q&A, because it is a webinar, um, I mm -hmm. guess we could do one of two ways. I think I can probably unmute all of our participants, right? I think I can do that. Sometimes that's um, dangerous. I, ah. Yeah, I think, I think let's do, if we could do it in the chat. chat. Perfect. Yep. And then I'll, yep. Either so, and then either if you want, I I can read, I can just read them out of the chat, or you can, yep. or someone can feed them to me. That's okay, sometimes what, a little easier. Yeah, we usually do the feeding thing only because then it's a little bit more um, like of a yeah. conversation. But um, in this case, Andy, what I'm almost leading towards letting you pick and choose because you would probably know the questions that should be answered and maybe the questions that shouldn't. You know what yep. I mean? And if there's a lot of them, you would have to make decisions and I don't want to do that for you. So, okay. all right. So we'll go with that. If it doesn't work, we'll figure, you know, we're, we're pretty laid back on this whole thing. So okay. um, we'll see how it, it all goes. It, it, all it right. is called backyard forestry in 90 minutes. If your presentation is 40, mm -hmm. I doubt very much they're going to have 50 minutes of questions, but uh, be a lot. Um, yeah. so we, we may get done much sooner than, um, than yeah. 90 minutes. And that's okay. happened before too, which is totally fine. Um, the other thing is I gave them the composition. I should have sent it to you too, but you don't know the players uh, of who attended, you know, who registered as of I don't know, half an hour, 15 minutes ago. Um, I do think we have some dissenters among us. <laughs> yeah. So um, not 100% sure. There's a lot of names. I usually know them all. And this time yeah. I, there's a lot I don't. Okay, right. so that's well, good. I I actually, I was thinking on the plane and I actually did some quick carbon accounting, which I was pretty excited about, Ooh. Um, which if the que the carbon question comes up, I, I probably know how much we're talking about. Fantastic. Which okay. even if it was a clear cut, which it's not, it's about the amount of carbon released from two plane trips. So you flew wow. down. What's wow. That? You flew down to, when you came down for the week? Weekend? Yeah. Wow. It's much Maybe. easier than trying to drive. Oh yeah. Yeah. So okay, we've got we're gonna go live. So we can let's keep chatting. This is usually what we do. We just keep chatting. Um okay. so let's get this party started. Yeah, your your presentation was fantastic on Saturday. And it's it's great that we're able to represent it as quickly. Um our our um, videographer did a great job of turning this around quickly. Yeah. Um I'm I'm interested to see how not just to to see what you had to say again because it was great, but also to see the videography end of it to see how that looks as well. Yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of cool presentations there. 
Yeah. I always, I always really struggle to watch myself. I was going <laughs> to say, I would not want to do things. that. <laughs> but, you know, it's always nice to, usually when I watch myself, it's watching myself in a webinar context like this that's been recorded. So I haven't watched myself that much do, you know, speaking in person. So it'll be cool to be able to see. Okay, very good. So welcome everybody that's joining us. Uh, we'll get started in just a few minutes. Give people time to sign on. So you you miss some fab, well, I guess the weather was okay this weekend, but we had like 60 degrees here. I don't know what it is up where you're at, but man, we're rocking this spring. <laughs> yeah, it's melted fast. I think I told you that two days before I came down, we got two feet of snow. Wow, um, crazy. Yeah, it was really crazy. And then I came down there, it was like 60 degrees. And I was like, what's going on? Yeah. Um, but it's, mel it's melting pretty fast now. It's raining here. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I'm ready. I'm ready to watch all these watch all these oak leaves come back and ready to see my spring ephemerals and all that yes. stuff. Yep, it's a great time of year for sure. I, I, I was telling some people about it, but um, I don't think I told either of you that when the whole time that I was uh, speaking and that I was on those panels that I was on, right through the window of the conference hall, I could see like a 25 inch diameter American beach that was like, totally smooth bark and uh i was just staring at that thing because we don't have beach like that don't have beach like that wow if, we, if i saw a beach tree even if i i almost never see big beach trees they get to be about six or eight inches in diameter and then they just die from beach bark disease mm -hmm. and uh when i do see big ones they're just just on the edge of their lives. And, you know, everybody in New Jersey, all the foresters and everybody was just like, oh, what's the big deal of beech tree? I'm like, I don't, it's it's a tree that we really struggle with up here, but um, I never get to see big, beautiful ones. It's like one of my favorite tree species when they're healthy like that. Yeah. It's just such a rarity. We planted that just for you, just so you know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you must have planted like about 120 years ago. Yeah, yeah we, we'd like to plant in advance, you know, so <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Hand, you probably have species of trees that are much bigger than what we have here. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, the one I was talking to Andy about that I think is Andy's favorite tree species is sugar maple. Nice. Yeah, we have some we have some big big sugar maples down here. And uh, also, um, it was interesting because I did um, I did a uh, uh, a seminar actually it was a, a two weekend two three-day weekends in Pennsylvania. I got to see some of the uh, the huge cherry trees that they have in Pennsylvania, much bigger than anything yeah. we have in New Jersey. They're huge. So yeah, well, it's interesting going from state to state, the differences you <laughs> see in, in the- I feel, I feel the same thing about black, well, black cherry up here. It's like this whizzled little tree. You know, it's got this, it, by the time they get big, they got this like crooked, strange top and they, they don't get very big very much. But when I was in, I worked briefly uh, on big, big pieces of land um, in the Adirondacks and former paper company land. And they had cherry that was just like, well, I was looking through the woods and it was shaded. And I just saw this like dark column, perfectly straight, huge tree. I thought it was a white pine and it was a black cherry. I'd never seen a black cherry like that before. Wow. It was incredible. Very nice. Okay, we're going to get started. So um, welcome everybody to, uh, let's see, we're still in March, right? I guess. So it's March's Backyard Forestry in 90 minutes online, of course, so that we can reach more people. Uh, I'm Lori Jensen, the Executive Director of the New Jersey Forestry Association. Really glad that you're here tonight. I did see uh, some people that we had just seen on Saturday come back today for the talk that uh, they want to see it again. So that's fantastic. And everybody that's uh, that wasn't there on Saturday, we're glad you're here as well. So um, let's get started. Um, I'll introduce Andy, um, our president. You wanna take over and run through these quick slides? Sure, we'll do the do a quickie here and then get to Ethan. So thank you everybody. It's, it's great that uh, you've been able to join us. Uh, we normally meet the third Thursday of the month and last month and this month we've put it off because of the short month in February. Um, we're back to the third Thursday in the month starting next month, we'll be back to the third Thursday. But uh, it is obviously on a Thursday. So thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, we have a wonderful program tonight. 
Uh, one of the things that we will be doing as well is um, uh, we have two dates set in May, May 6th and May 11th, to do a walk in the woods. And it's going to be at uh, Sussex County at uh, one of those wonderful places that um, we all like to talk about, Sparta Mountain. Uh, be interesting to see. I have not myself been to Sparta Mountain in several years. I was there when the pro programs first started up there. I'm really looking forward to getting up there to seeing the changes that have taken place in the last five years or so since I was last there. And I suspect they will be considerable. So um, they are going to be limited. I think we have uh, 15 people uh, each, a uh, limit of 15 people each day on Saturday, May 6th, and again, Thursday, May 11th. But it's a great opportunity to see how the progress has gone in Sparta Mountain. And I might add that this photo that you're looking at is from Sparta Mountain. So, of course. So, moving along. Okay, um, we go through this all the time, but I know that there may be some people who have not uh, been on this presentation in the past. But there are a number of things that we do in the New Jersey Forestry Association that, that make membership um, important. I do know that a number of the people on the presentation tonight are not members of the Forestry Association. We certainly would encourage you to join. Uh, we do have newsletters. We have our website. We have the annual meeting, which was last week and which this meeting tonight is a result from. We have the New Jersey Woodland Stewards Program which hopefully we'll be back in person again this year. We have some meetings coming up on that to see if we can do that. That's a three and a half day program where you actually get into the forest. And uh, yeah, it's kind of like forestry 101. And it's uh, uh, really a, a great opportunity to learn more about the forest. Back here at Forestry 90 Minutes, of course, is what we're doing tonight. Uh, we do have the landowner representation. And one of the biggest things we do there is reviewing um, farmland assessment. And uh, we're in the process of uh, several years ago, we had done some presentations throughout the state on farmland assessment as it is applied to woodlands. And uh, we're just in, in the process of updating that presentation and we hope to roll it out again this year. Not sure how we're gonna do it. In the past, we did it in person. We are finding, uh, for instance, like tonight, we're finding that more people are getting involved online. Uh, maybe an online presentation, it may be a hybrid in person online, but in any case, uh, farmland assessment is very important to, uh, to our members and is something we need to stay on top of. And of course, legislative monitoring, uh, for those of you who were at the meeting on Saturday, you were able to uh, hear a little bit from our um, uh, the people that represent us in, uh, in Trenton and the, the things that are monitoring. And there are some very interesting pieces of legislation that we are monitoring right now that do have an impact on woodland owners. So an important part of what we do, all things that um, uh, come about because we have a membership and our membership is not that expensive. So we do encourage people to join the association so that they can get benefit of all the things that we are doing. And here we go. All right. Let's start. So for those um, that know, we, we do have Ethan Tapper here live, which is great, but this is a recording of the presentation that he gave uh, at our annual, annual meeting on Saturday. So I'm just gonna hopefully start the presentation. Uh, just give me a minute. Andy, you're gonna give me the heads up so I know that it's working and that you can hear, okay? And then- if, Okay. The, oh, go ahead, Ethan. I would just say during the presentation, if you have questions that you think of, we're not going to stop the presentation midstream. So just pop them in the chat and we'll get to them with the live Q&A after. Perfect. Thank you. And away we go, hopefully. <laughs> there it is. There's Ethan. Okay. Who's that? Right, <laughs> <laughs> he looks happy. <laughs> He's looking out at a tree, actually. No. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Uh, again, Andy, just give me the thumbs up so I know that it's all good, okay? So okay. I'm Ethan Tapper. I'm the Chittenden County Forester. Um, good. Why would you know what a Vermont County Forester does? For those of you who don't know what a Vermont County Forester does, we are part of Vermont's private lands program. So in Vermont, it's a little bit different the, the way that our lands are owned than here in New Jersey. We have, we're 75% forested, 80% of those lands are owned by private landowners. And so, of course, from those private lands, we're all receiving all of these benefits. We're getting clean air and clean water. We're getting wildlife habitat and biodiversity protection. Um, all of these benefits, which are mostly coming from private landowners. And of course, there's no 
tests that you have to pass to become a private landowner, but we all have a real interest in helping those people manage that land well, both to protect uh, the resources on their own land and to protect our collective interest in all those things. So the, the county forester program in Vermont was started in the 1940s. Um, it's been around a long time, and there's a, a county forester for each county. Our job is basically fourfold. So number one, we deal with the equivalent of New Jersey's forest stewardship program, a tax abatement program on forested lands. Number two, we provide stewardship to private landowners, whether you own a couple acres or a couple thousand acres. We just will advise them on how to manage the land responsibly, how to take care of it, go take a walk with them, talk about what's going on in their land. Number three, we manage municipal forests. So I manage about a dozen community forests in the county, covering about 4,500 acres. And number four, we just sort of try to answer this question of how do we improve the quality of forest management and the health of forests in our county with the forests that we have and the people that we have and the threats and the stressors that we're dealing with. And so for each of our 14 counties, the answer to that question looks really different. I've gotten really excited about just communication. So I write these monthly columns in a bunch of community newspapers. I write a quarterly column in this awesome magazine called Northern Woodlands Magazine, have a YouTube channel. I do dozens of public events a year. Um, and a big reason for that is just understanding that one of the big barriers between us and understanding our forests and thus being able to manage our forests responsibly is nuance. And just understanding that as much as we would like to believe that forests and forestry are one thing, that it's many things. And that our understanding of the work that we do is, is built on balances and compromises and us addressing many different things at once. Um, and the way that we do that is through helping people understand the nuances and the complexities of what it means to be a forest steward. So in this presentation, um, we're going to talk just about, it's sort of the presentation that I will often give to people as almost an introductory pre presentation for how we think about forests, but then also getting into some more nuances of forest management, how we can think about the management of forests, and if we have time, a little bit into how we talk about forests and how we think about how we talk about forests. So reimagining forests. So this is something that I often uh, will start a presentation or a walk with is saying that we all know what forests are, right? And we're sure that we know what forests are. But just open yourself up to the possibility that our intuitive understanding with forests might not be exactly right. And that if we need to, if we're really going to take care of forests, especially at this strange moment in time, we need to reimagine what they are and what it means to care for them. So what's a forest? You know, you know one when you see one, right? It's a bunch of trees in a place. There's like some animals in there, maybe running around. Um, a lot of people, it's one of these things where it's like, we all know what it is, but actually what is it? This is a definition of a natural community. It's from this book called Wetland, Woodland, Wildland. It's a Vermont-focused book on the natural communities of Vermont by Liz Thompson and Eric Sorensen. And it has this definition that I think describes forests and other ecosystems really well. And it's that they are, quote, an interacting assemblage of organisms, their physical environment, and the natural processes that affect them. So it's the trees, but it's also all these other pieces and parts that comprise the system. It is trees and plants and birds and rodents and mosses and lichen and fungi, soils, and even the processes that move and shape those components of the forested ecosystem. So what we know about forest ecology is it's about all these living things. It's about non-living things like soil, although it's debatably also a living thing. And then it's also about even the way that forests change over time. And when you really get into the nuances of forest ecology, you find that these changes and even stuff like tree mortality are some of the most exciting parts of how forests work. Um, so when I think of a forest, the, the best analogy that I have for it is it's like a coral reef. The trees are like the coral. They're this living structure around which the communi this community is built. But of course, if we're thinking about a coral reef, we would never just think about the coral itself. We would think about this community that is woven around that living structure, right? And, and if we were to manage that coral reef, the success of our management will be based not on our ability to take care of just the coral, 
but to take care of that entire community. So that's what we're learning is as we reimagine forests, we're reimagining them not just as the trees, but as this entire community. And reimagining what forest management is, is not just managing the individual life of each one of those trees, but how do we manage this entire system, including managing how it changes. Biodiversity is sort of like, you know, it's a, it's a really important term. Anybody know, heard of that guy, E.O. Wilson? He's this amazing scientist, pretty famous. Look up E.O. Wilson, Edward O. Wilson. Um, he's written a bunch of different books. He's a myrmecologist, which means he's an ant scientist. And he's just excited about biodiversity. Biodiversity is a contraction of biological diversity. And what biodiversity is, is the variation between species within an ecosystem, the variation between ecosystems across our landscape, and the variation between the genetics within an individual species. So it's the way, it's the diversity of all these different things layered atop one another. And biodiversity is cool, right? We have all these different species, tens of thousands of species that comprise these forested ecosystems, and they are, of course, individually important and intrinsically important. And then we also realize that without that entire community of species, that forest cannot exist. So it's more than just about protecting things that are neat or that are pretty. It's about protection, protecting the function of that system. And it's really, hard, <laughs> it's really hard to talk about how forests work and to talk about forest management because almost everybody that I meet, and I think that this is just intuitive, this is just ingrained in us, thinks that that is what a healthy forest looks like. It is evenly spaced trees, uh, nothing growing in the understory. It looks like a park. And if you walk into that forest, most of us, on some level, you're like, yes, this is great. You know, and, and if we, a lot of landowners, as they're managing their forests, they are, uh, on some level or another, managing to that image. A lot of landowners, they're picking up dead wood that's laying on the ground, they're cutting down dead standing trees, they're trying to make their forest look like a park. They're raking up all the sticks and making them into windrows and all this stuff. Um, so one thing I've realized about this is that in, in an uh, understanding of what healthy forests look like is not intuitive to most people, certainly most people that I meet. It's something that we need to develop actively. And we need to, in order to do that, we need to understand that what a healthy forest looks like and what it means to take care of it is unintuitive. And so it will make us feel uncomfortable because we're going against this really intuitive idea of what a healthy forest looks like and what it means to take care of it. It's incredibly important and I think radical to sort of allow yourself to reimagine what a healthy forest looks like and what it means to take care of it, even when that makes us uncomfortable. What a healthy forest really look like? Bam! <laughs> this is maybe like a little, like laying it on a little thick, but, but the, the point is when you start to study forests over time and you start to study them as complete communities, you find that what's really exciting about them is not the individual living trees and their ability to stay alive forever. What's exciting about them is the fact that they're dynamic, the fact that trees are dying, the fact that change is occurring, and all of the different things that that means for a forest community. Oh, the formatting on this one got a little weird. What that says is late successional slash old growth forests. So we do have a template in some cases for what forests would look like if they were unmanaged. And this is what we call so-called old growth forests. I'll talk about it in a second. Old growth can be a little bit of a, a term that can mean different things. Or late successional forests. What a late successional forest is, is basically a forest which has been undisturbed uh, by people for a long period of time. How long? It depends on who you ask. It depends on the forest type. Some people would say 150 years. We think that for like the dead wood characteristics of late successional forest to develop, it's going to take more like 300 years plus. Um, if we look at these late successional forests, they do not look like parks. They are multi-generational, so they feature all different sizes and ages of trees. They're combined by many different generations of trees in this multi-layered canopy comprised of that. Uh, they're diverse, but often they're sort of skewing towards these more shade-tolerant tree species. Where I live, that would be species like eastern hemlock and beech and sugar maple. There is dead wood 
absolutely everywhere. Um, I actually have a funny story about that. In my county, there's this piece of forest called Williams Woods. And Williams Woods, it may have been cut a little bit in the past, but it was never cleared. And so I took this group out to Williams Woods, and they knew we were going to look at this old growth forest. And so we go out, and we're in this stand, which is 80-year-old pine trees and sugar maple poles underneath, and the leaves are changing on the sugar maples, and it's just beautiful. And everybody says, wow, old growth forests are beautiful. And I say, yeah, this was a field 80 years ago. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we're not in the old growth forest yet. And then we sort of like walk along the path, and then we enter the old growth forest. And I hear someone's voice from behind me going, oh, I don't like that. <laughs> It's not into, it's scary, you know, to a lot of people. It's jarring. There are huge dead trees on the ground. There are many different ages of trees. It's hard to get through. There are a lot of big old trees that are sort of alive and sort of dead. It's like all of these different things at once. And it's, it's something that is difficult to appreciate. And if we were to take out, you know, again, mortality and the legacies of mortality, tree mortality, is such an important part of that, that if you were to take out a bunch of wildlife biologists and ecologists into an old growth forest, they wouldn't even be paying attention to the living trees mostly. They would be right on that dead wood and all of those other different legacy disturbance, talking about the gaps in the canopy, you know, talking about the dead standing trees, all of these other things which are both vital to forest function, vital to wildlife habitat, and are also so underrepresented in the forest that we have today. Whoop. Forests do this amazing thing. I call it the miracle of regeneration, where they basically, what creates that multi-generationality in an old forest over time, and what creates this amazing regeneration, whenever a disturbance, natural or human cause, uh, happens, is this thing that forests do where they just fill space with life. Right? You just, by creating an opening in the forest, you know, and this is independent of many of the stressors like deer browse and non-native invasive plants that we're going to talk about as well. Uh, independent of those stressors, you create an opening in the canopy of the forest and it regenerates. And it's like magic. And actually, you know, by creating openings in the forest of different shapes and sizes, you can manifest tree species diversity because our tree species are adapted to a gradient of different light conditions. So you create openings of a gradient of different sizes. Theoretically, you're getting a gradient of different species. It's also really interesting when you start to understand the way that different species grow and the conditions under which a species can establish. Because then you can look back in your forest and you can realize that every generation of trees in your forest is the legacy of a disturbance. If you have a generation of trees in your forest that all are about 30 years old, you can infer that 30 years ago something happened. It was logging, it was a natural disturbance, it was something that caused a large amount of light to be released to the forest floor and for that regeneration to establish. And if you start to, you can even get a little more granular, which is when you start to think about the species that comprise those different, those different generations of trees. Like where I am, white birch and aspen only grow like completely in the open. And so if we see a generation of trees and they're comprised of those species, we can infer that that forest, as you know, beautiful and eternal and unchanging as it may seem, was actually subject to a large-scale natural disturbance in the past. Messy is good. Um, I have sort of already talked about this, but this is a really important concept for people to understand, both on your own woodlots and as you look at, at forest management <clears throat> and also unmanaged forests. Um, is that messiness is a really important part of how forests work. And, and messiness is sort of in quotes because it's messiness as we understand it, right? It's messiness as it sort of contradicts that intuitive idea we have about what a, a, a well-managed or a healthy forest looks like. Whenever I'm talking to people about forests, I like to address two misconceptions. Misconception number one, that forests are static and unchanging. Trees live a long time, but they are dynamic. They are defined by change. Misconception number two, that forests are supposed to look nice to us. They are not. They are what they are, independent of whether we think it looks nice. Um, and it's up to us to sort of meet them where they are, not to change them to make them more, more pretty to us. In my opinion, this is the greatest book ever, popular book ever written about forests. 
It's called The Hidden Forest, Biography of an Ecosystem, not to be confused with The Hidden Life of Trees. Um, the Hidden Forest by John R. Luoma. And he says, quote, ecologists have come to believe that forest ecosystems are, in fact, as much about disturbance as they are about stability. So I like to say it's sort of like learning to see the forest, not just for the trees themselves, but for the spaces between the trees. You know, when you, when you look into a forest and it has just experienced a windstorm or a forest fire or forest management, learning to see that those spaces in the forest are themselves generative, right? They are life which is just waiting to happen. They are a more diverse forest which is about to become on that site right there. And it's really important. It's also very confusing because it takes a really long time. You're not going to get the immediate gratification of, you know, you manage a forest and then instantly it regenerates. You have to wait, which is sort of the most interesting and trying time of being a forest steward in many cases, is waiting for a lot of these things to occur on their own schedule. One thing that's also important to know, and this is again why that term old growth is, is complex, is because I, I talked about what a late successional or old growth forest looks like, and that's specifically an area of forest that hasn't, that's, hasn't been extensively disturbed for a long period of time, let's say more than 300 years general average, although these forests are defined by their irregularity and their variability. But when we look at our landscapes, we see that our landscapes were not just that. That actually, you know, every stage of forest development, every stage of succession is normal and natural and it has been around for thousands of years and have species that are adapted to them. Right? So it's not just like every stage of forest development is a means to an end to that climax community. It's that every stage of forest development is valuable. So like we have species that are adapted to early successional forests. We have species that are adapted to everything in between that and an old growth, and what we call old growth or late successional forest. And so what we really need is landscape level diversity. We need a diversity of forests at different stages of development, different types, spread across our landscape, which is probably what we would have found if we were standing here 300 years ago, would be not just a, a monolith, but many different things um, across our landscape. So I'm more familiar with Vermont's forest history than New Jersey's forest history, but fortunately, it's very similar. Um, you can't talk about forests without talking about history. I'll put my phone up here so I can keep an eye on the time. So what we saw in New England in the 1800s, to, or in the, in the 1800s, largely, was wholesale land clearing. So you can assume that virtually every forest you've ever been in was a pasture at some time in the 1800s, right? So we're replacing these forests which had been relatively undisturbed, although in New Jersey I know there was uh, a fair amount of indigenous burning that was probably occurring around coastal areas. But, um, we, we saw these areas that were, you know, largely these old growth landscapes that were cleared of forests in a very short period of time. In Vermont, it was a single human generation. It was like between 1810 and 1850, 80% of the forests on our landscape were cleared. Um, and as you can imagine, it's actually pretty amazing when you think about it. 1800s, you know, they're doing it with oxes and horses and, you know, saws. Uh, it, it would be a pretty big lift to do that with all the equipment that we have now, wouldn't it? So the narrative is that a lot of that was for pasture, sheep pasture in particular. There was like this in Vermont and other parts of New England, there was this merino sheep craze that was a big deal. There was also, you know, a lot of forest exploitation. So p these early European colonists were uh, using wood for everything. The railroad was a big user of wood. The, the trains were running on wood. And they were also using an incredible amount of wood just in railroad ties. There's this amazing book by Eric Rutko, American Canopy, where he goes through a lot of these different elements of forest history. Um, so one of the things he said is by the mid-1800s, railroads were using seven million cords of wood annually, you know, just as fuel, and that they were using just to replace the railroad ties that were rotting, not to create any new sections of railroad, they were using the equivalent of the timber from 150,000 acres a year. This is pre-advent of the wood stove, so a normal home was burning 40 to 60 cords of wood a year, um, and they, were, they needed wood for all of these fence posts, right, because they were making everything into pasture. In certain parts of New England, fence posts became a kind of currency by the mid-1800s. 
As you can imagine, it had a lot of effects on wildlife. So that's the eastern cougar. Um, ex that's the last one that was shot in Vermont in 1881. There was, you know, if you can imagine, you go from a vastly, you know, majority forested landscape to a majority cleared landscape over a relatively short period of time, and you're going to lose all kinds of species. So in Vermont, we lost all the beaver and the turkey and the fisher and the moose, caribou and eastern elk, um, Canada geese, catamount wolves, bear otter, mar uh, marten, passenger pigeons, and others. Some of those were reintroduced. This is beaver reintroduction, which has happened in most of the states in New England. Also, turkeys have been reintroduced. Fisher have been reintroduced. Um, in Vermont, white-tailed deer were reintroduced. I know in Pennsylvania, eastern elk was reintroduced with some elk that they like put on a train from Yellowstone. Um, some of these other species were able to recolonize our landscape. But that legacy remains. So it's really important as we think about what our forests are now that we're understanding like that where we are right now is not a normal place to be. There's this thing that I think about a lot called shifting baseline hypothesis where we assume that whatever we're used to is normal, right? The forests that we have today are not normal. They're normal only in the context of what we're accustomed to, in the context of the millennia of adaptation and change that these forests and the species that comprise them are adapted to, it is completely abnormal. So they are disproportionately younger. So we're talking about mostly forests that are like less than 110 years old. Again, to become an old growth forest, we're talking 300 years plus. Um, forests lacking big trees, lacking structural diversity, different sizes and ages of trees, and also species diversity, and also landscapes that are lacking those kinds of, that landscape level diversity. Um, also lacking things like dead wood, soil carbon, and vastly different forest composition, because most of our forests are a single generation of trees that grew out of a pasture. If you, you know, growing out of a pasture is not a normal thing for a tree here to have been adapted to doing. So like in Vermont, White pine is good at growing in pastures, so it's growing everywhere because every forest was a pasture, but it doesn't, you know, we're not actually seeing that suite of species that are adapted to that site. We're seeing species that are adapted to growing in pastures on that site. Um, so our forests are extremely, extremely altered. At the same time, we're dealing with this, this suite of threats that we refer to as global change. So global change, I find, as a, as a forest steward, is a better way to think about the threats that our forests are facing in the future than climate change. Global change is the composite of all the threats and stressors that our forests face, which includes climate change and also things like non-native invasive plants, pests, pathogens, animals, uh, pollution, forest loss, conversion, forest fragmentation, deforestation, um, global biodiversity loss, and all these other things, which together if we were just responding to climate change, it would be relatively simple to understand what we need to do. If we're responding to an incredible array of different stressors, it becomes a little bit more complex, right? Because there are balances there. The thing that's good for one thing may be less good for another thing, and so we have to find this sort of dynamic balance. So global change is, I, I think, a really important term for us to be familiar with. We're also dealing with these, these biodiversity threats, so deer, Somewhat overpopulated in Vermont, I know extremely overpopulated in, in parts of New Jersey, certainly. Major threat to biodiversity um, and to our future forests. Uh, major threat to biodiversity really across a lot of North America. Non-native invasive plants, huge deal. Deforestation and development, as was mentioned in the last presentation, like that's the one that really keeps me up at night because we can't do anything unless we can keep our forests as forests. That should say biodiversity crisis. So it's important to understand that we're also in a global constriction of biodiversity, a period of time that has been termed by some the Anthropocene, uh, an era in which human influence is the primary driver that's influencing our ecosystems globally. Um, we're in the middle of just this incredibly difficult time. Animal populations have declined more than 50% since 1970. That means 50% of the animals on the planet that there were 50 years ago. Some people would say as much as 68% decline. A million species of animals are threatened with extinction. Um, it's a big deal. And again, remembering that, you know, it's important to take care of those animals, there's all those different species, the millions of species that comprise our ecosystems for their own sake, but then also, those taking care of those species is integrally, integrally related to 
taking care of our ecosystems. They can't function without them. We can't just grow trees. So with extinctions or with invasives or whatever, we often wonder what would happen if we continue to pull apart pieces and parts of our ecosystems? Um, at what point would they continue to break down and we would just be completely off the map? So the answer is that we're already there. So we are, we are already off the map. We are already in, an in, a, in a totally unknown and uncharted territory for our forests. And so the question then is, is what do we do about it? Which brings up this question, I think about this word a lot, responsibility. So wondering, in, the, in, the, in this changed world, in these alter ecosystems, what do we owe to these ecosystems? What do we owe to each other? What is our responsibility to them? What's our responsibility to each other in the context of all of these different things? Um, we are certainly, as a species, the largest threat to forests and other ecosystems, and we are also probably their only hope. So it's up to us to figure out how we reimagine our relationship with these systems from being an antagonist to being a keystone species. And I would also say, we already have the tools to solve all these problems, we just need to decide to do it. So, reimagining forest management. If we're, if we're gonna manage forests, how are we gonna do it in a way that's gonna be about building a better world? So being, that's about where we are at this moment in time, where our forests are at this unprecedented moment in time, and the threats and challenges that we're facing, which again are completely off the map. Um, and so we need to ask ourselves, can forest management have a positive influence on a world and on each other? Um, I think the answer is yes. So I practice a type of forestry called ecological forestry, which you know, probably most of the people in this room practice a version of. You might just not, not know it yet. Um, ecological forestry is just basically the idea that we're managing forests like they manage themselves. So instead of treating a forest like it's a timber farm or a plantation or something that, you know, we're solely managing like a, like a cornfield, we're looking at the way that natural forests work. We're looking at old growth forests and we're looking at these natural disturbance regimes, the way that forests change over time, and we're trying to manage them within the context of the way that those systems work right? It makes all the sense in the world. You're like dealing with these incredibly intricate and beautiful system that is a forest, and then why wouldn't you want to manage that forest in the way that it works, right? What does that mean? Um, it can mean a lot of different things. Um, in some cases, it can mean doing nothing. But in a lot of cases, what it means is trying to hold all of those different pieces of parts of this moment in time that our forests are at. It means creating these simulation natural disturbances using logging as a tool, right? So we can't make forests, well, I'll talk about that in a second. We can't make forests old growth, but we can make them old growthier. We're realizing that a lot of the attributes that are missing from our forest are the same as those attributes I described that are part of late successional forests. So things like multi-generationality, dead wood, big trees, all of those things, with the exception of big trees, although we can make trees grow, get bigger faster, all of those things are things that we can create using forest management as a tool, and we can create them actually centuries sooner than they will naturally occur. So if you want, if you're interested in old growth forests and the, the benefits of late successional forests, uh, that's great. And I think that there's actually a real consensus in the conservation community that leaving some forests unmanaged to become old growth on their own is a good idea. The problem with that is that it takes centuries and that we need those qualities and those attributes and those habitats now. And the other issue is that because of the incredibly altered nature of our forests, not every forest has the ability to become an old growth forest now, and inaction is not a blanket solution to all of our problems. Um, so we're creating spatial heterogeneity, we're creating multi-generationality, we're creating spatial heterogeneity, heterogeneity. All that means is just we're creating different openings of different sizes, letting them regenerate in different ways, what we call sometimes horizontal structural diversity. We're leaving tons of dead wood on the ground. Sometimes in these forests of our world, which are so bereft of dead wood, which is just this incredibly, <laughs> incredibly important part of our forests that is often neglected, um, I'm almost as excited to put dead wood on the ground, honestly, as I am about any other part of the project. Here's a fun fact. Um, <laughs> 
that, off, that blew my mind when I heard it, which is that a dead tree can have as much as four times the living biomass as a living tree. There is a community to whom that is habitat. And as they're breaking down that dead wood, they're out there turning it into soil. They're also helping that become soil, soil or uh, carbon, which is incorporated into the soil. They're also benefiting soil hydrology and doing a lot of other stuff. So we're putting dead wood on the ground, and we're also creating early successional habitat and other habitats that are underrepresented across our landscape in an effort to, number one, protect species of concern because our biodiversity is precious. And we know that a lot of species that are struggling right now, weirdly, are those that are adapted to those early successional forests. Um, and we also want to create that landscape level diversity because we know that it benefits all of our biodiversity. We're managing forests for what we call resilience. So basically this is the understanding that we are headed into this time period where we expect change to be even more of a disruptive, to be more of a disruptive factor in the way that forests grow. So we have these changing natural disturbance regimes, storms of increasing severity and frequency, wildfires of increasing severity. Um, and we need to recognize that managing our forest for stability is not what we need to do. We need to trade that for an idea of recognizing that uh, stability, that stability is not strength, that resilience is strength, that we need to recognize that forests can't, that they will change and give them the tools to change uh, while retaining all of the natural processes and habitats that they need to to protect their health as a system. But at the same time, it's not like we're giving them the tools to go back to some previous condition. We're recognizing that they're never going to be like the old growth forests that were here 300 years ago. They're going to be changed. And so we need to help our forests also adapt, you know, to manage forests which are adaptive in nature with the tools required to move into the future. How do we manage forests that are resilient and adaptive? Interestingly, the recommendations that we're seeing are many of the same recommendations of managing for late successional forest attributes and also managing for old growth landscapes. So we don't want to put all of our eggs in one basket. We want to manage for a lot of different things at once. We want to manage for within an individual forest structural diversity, again, that mul multiple generations of trees, species diversity, different species of trees, big old trees, dead wood, seems like it's the answer to everything, right? And then also having that landscape level diversity as well. And then also dealing with biodiversity threats. So a forest cannot change, cannot adapt, cannot respond to the, threats, the stressors that we're facing or anything that we do if it doesn't have the ability to regenerate. So, or to be able to, you know, steward that regeneration into the canopy. So dealing with things like non-native invasive plants, pests and pathogens, and deer overpopulation are really, really important parts of both forest adaptation and forest resilience. I've been getting into this, this, this sort of subset of ecological forestry, which is called managing for old growth characteristics. It's really exciting because, you know, I think that people are captivated by old growth, both because it's like just cool and primeval, and also because it has all of these really interesting qualities, which we know are true, right? It like, stores a lot of carbon and like has really unique biodiversity and it's so underrepresented on our landscape. But what's really, really important to understand is that, you know, old growth forests, for the most part, in a function, from a functional perspective, are not cool just because they're old. They are important because of the attributes that they have. Again, I don't know how many times I'm going to say this, multi-generationality, big trees, dead wood, spatial heterogeneity, etc. over and over again, which are again attributes that we can create. We can't make an old growth forest, but we can make it old growthier again. So there's this really amazing resource from Tony D'Amato and Paul Cananzaro called Managing for Late Successional Attributes. So it's actually asking this question like, you know, saying, okay, well we love old forests. We know that we want to protect all of our existing old forests. We know that we want to leave some forests unmanaged to become old forests. But also, how do we actively address this moment that we're in by managing forests to be like old forests on a compressed time scale so that we can have those attributes in the short term? Um, there's this idea of intact forests. Have any of you heard of this term, an intact forest? Um, it's defined by some to be forests which are free from human intervention. Right? So an intact forest, it doesn't matter what qualities it has, it doesn't matter what it looks like, it's just a forest that 
is humans are not managing. And I sort of, you know, maybe this is out of context if you haven't heard this term before, but I sort of chafe at this idea because, again, I think it is so important to understand that what makes a forest intact is the qualities that it has, right? It's not whether we're creating these attributes or whether these attributes are cre being created by a natural disturbance is less important to me than the fact that we have habitat for a wide range of our biodiversity, that we have forests that are adaptive and resilient, that we're giving uh, our wildlife the tools to adapt to this moment, and that we're protecting this community writ large. Um, that's what will make this forest intact. It doesn't matter if it's we're doing it or if it's happening naturally. It's that those attributes are there. Five minutes. Two more slides. Um, and I think about this when I, talk to, when I talk to landowners about that. It's actually sort of an exciting moment that we're in right now, right? Because we hear of these accounts of forests that existed here just a few hundred years ago. And they were, we hear these accounts of just game and fish and life beyond imagining, right? Um, we have the opportunity, if we choose to do so, to help rediscover a portion of that, right? So we have an opportunity to rediscover a capacity for life in our forests, again, by managing them and by helping them rediscover those attributes that have been lost um, and protecting all of these different species in all these different ways. We have an opportunity to do that and to sort of rediscover this capacity of life, which we've never seen, right? Which is totally beyond our wildest imagination and again, we just totally, we need to choose to do so, and we need to be willing to make the uncomfortable choices necessary to get us there. We're not going to do it by doing nothing. So when I talk to people, look at that. When I talk to people about forests and about forest management, and I help them understand that the way that I see forest management is really as an act of compassion. Um, what does it mean to love a forest in this moment in time? How do we address this moment that we're in and how do we respond and we talk about what we're doing and I do these demonstration forest management projects and then we get out to the log landing and we look at that wood pile and it's such an interesting and catalyzing moment and the reason for that is because our challenge as, as forest stewards and as humans at this moment in time is not just to make our forests healthier right it's to find a way to do that while also living here and wouldn't it be amazing if we didn't need to consume anything to exist. And the fact is that we do, right? And the fact is that the real question is not like, how do we make our forests healthier? It's how do we develop a relationship with this ecosystem that is positive and regenerative while we're also getting the things that we need to survive? Wood is a local renewable resource, and we know that, it ha that local renewable resources have global biodiversity and human rights benefits. We know that when we say not in my backyard to resource consumption, that we're just displacing the impacts of our lives on people who don't have the privilege to say not in my backyard. And that in places where we don't have the ability to have any say over how those resources are produced. We know that if we're saying no wood here, it just means more wood somewhere else, which will often be in these forests that are managed in this industrial way that may be way worse from our, from our perspective. And so this, in my mind, this is not a contradiction of what we're doing. This is like the most radical part of it. We're doing all of these things within the context of commercial management while we're also producing local renewable resources as a byproduct, and that's beautiful. I got to stop, but I'm going to be on a couple more panels, maybe get to talk about a few more other things, but I'll just leave you with this idea. What does it mean to love a forest? at this moment in time. It's really strange. It's really unintuitive at times, and it requires us to make these big compromises, to change the way that we think about forests and the way that we think about managing forests. Um, but that's what makes it so important, and that's what makes it so powerful. Thanks. Wow. Wow again. Okay, that was great. I'm glad I got to see that a second time. And I see Andy has joined us. Hi, Andy Bennett. Um, 
He's yeah. muted. That's okay. Uh, so I did see there were a couple questions. I'm, I'd also like to urge the people that are um, with us today, pop pop your questions either in chat and Q&A, doesn't matter. And um, let's see what we have question wise. Sure. Let's see, well, so M Mary had a question, but it was it's uh, related to uh, uh, Forrest here that you wouldn't know about Ethan. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if Andy can answer this or if you want to answer it in a more generic fashion. Yeah, so the, the question, yeah, the question is just, are you familiar with, is it Met Metlar? Metlar? Metler Woods. Metler Woods. Metler Woods in mm -hmm. Somerset, New Jersey. Old growth forest has never been logged, protected by 10 foot fence to keep deer and humans out. It is stunning. Yeah, it's pretty cool. You know, it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited about management. Um, and I think it can be done in this really positive way. And, but I think it's also important to acknowledge that uh, I'm also a strong advocate for, for old growth forests to, to obviously protect all existing old growth forests and to even to leave forests unmanaged to become old growth on our own, on their own, and then to steward some forests to get them to a place where they can become old growth on their own. Um, I think that, that one of the things that sometimes gets lost as we have these discussions about management or no management um, is that, you know, really the, the approach that we need, and this is really the, the consensus of our conservation community is that we need both things. That, that neither thing gets us everything that we need, that both things have different benefits. Um, and then also, you know, that, that many, many of, you know, myself and many of the most responsible forest stewards that I know, we celebrate management done in the right way. And we also would like celebrate old growth forests. And, you know, an, an example, like putting up that deer fence is a really good example of, you know, that is a responsible way to protect that resource. Like if we were to just, you know, not, if there's a really high deer population in the area, we were to not put a deer fence around that, we would just be completely ignoring the fact that here are these threats and stressors of this modern world. And, you know, that, that old growth forest will not be able to function normally unless we address them. Similar, similar thing with non-native invasive plants. You know, I, I view the minimum responsible level of, of management to be no management plus invasive plant management. Again, because the, you know, forests can't, if we can't deal with these threats to their regeneration, they, they can't move forward. They can't become old growth forests. They can't regenerate. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, without knowing that piece, I think that's what I would say about that. Old growth forests are amazing and I wanna have a lot more of them for sure. Um, I see someone also said, as I hike in the woods, I see pockets which were once all ash trees that are now a huge area of oh, of dead and fallen trees due to emerald ash borer. Are there are these areas of diseased trees also considered good for biodiversity and successional growth? It's tricky, you know. That um, it's bittersweet, and and it's mostly bitter. Um, so, the loss of a species, or even the, even the functional loss of a species, is a big deal. Uh, and we were talking about beach beforehand. There, you know, there's there's several species certainly here in Vermont that we haven't lost entirely, but they're experiencing this thing that's called cryptic function loss, which is basically that they're still present in our ecosystems, but they're not doing what they once did. So where I am in Vermont, uh, beach bark disease, beach trees used to be 60% of all the trees um, prior to European colonization in my county. Now they're like three to 5% of the trees. And instead of you know, being these incredibly prominent trees that were capable of living for 400 years, they live to be 20 or 40 and they die. Um, and so you know, even though that species has not gone extinct, we've, we've lost a lot of the functions that would have been associated with a big 400 year old healthy beech tree. Um, and so, you know, same with the ash, we, we expect that you know, to a certain extent, we'll, we might still have some, some white ash around maybe, but a lot of those functions will be lost. And that's sad, you know, we, we, we don't know all of the pieces and parts that comprise our forest, all of the different insects and animals that may rely on ash trees of different sizes and 
in different situations for some or all parts of their life cycle. And, you know, and we also know that ash is a, it's an important part of our forest. It fills a, fills an important uh, role in that forest community. You know, so it's sad um, and it's bad and we should do everything that we can to, to figure out how to protect that species, how to promote resistance in that species, how to promote biocontrols that are gonna protect the ash. Um, if that's something that we can do responsibly and, um, you know, to even treat some ash trees, to save them as like seed bearing individuals or, or, or just to have some living ash trees that are still around. That said, um, you know, some of the, as trees die, they do, they are not totally bad, right? So as trees die in general, the independent of the ash thing, it can actually be this really important moment ecologically. You know, dead standing trees, incredibly important habitat. Deadwood on the ground, as I talked about in that presentation, incredibly important habitat. Both things that are also underrepresented in our modern forest. So, so it's not, you know, that is, does provide some measure of benefit, but certainly not the measure, certainly not the benefits that would be provided if that uh, tree wasn't being afflicted by emerald ash borer. So, oh yeah, I assume someone wrote, I assume your management plans implicitly include carbon sequestration. Carbon sequestration and storage, and they ex explicitly contain it. And so one of the things that's really important and, and you know, carbon, as I'm sure a lot of people in here know, is this whole, is, is really complex. Um, but one of the things that we're realizing is that uh, all carbon is not created equal. Right? So I've been really into this idea. There's actually a great article on it in the most recent issue of Northern Woodlands um, that my friend, Dr. Ali Kasiba wrote. And it was about this, it was about a lot of things, but um, it was also about this idea of resilient carbon. So recognizing, you know, so I referred to these stands of trees, these young forests uh, where I am that are these monocultures of unhealthy white pine that have grown up out of a pasture. They're not even a species that's well suited to the site where they're growing. They're just a function of that historic land use. Um, you know, there, there are some research that says, you know, we don't manage a forest. It's gonna sequester and store more carbon, mostly store more carbon. And, and that's and on, in a certain level, on the short term, that's true. The thing that we need to also recognize though, is that carbon is this incredibly complex thing. What it is, is basically it's a byproduct of photosynthesis. As trees are photosynthesizing, they're fixing aerial carbon from the atmosphere and they're turning it into wood and leaves and, you know, parts of, parts of themselves. And so the ability of, a, of an individual tree to sequester carbon and to ultimately store it in its body is a function of its health. Right, and the ability of a forest to sequester and store carbon is also a function of its health. So it's not even, you know, necessarily just strictly about the trees that are there now. The ability of that system in the long term to uptake and to store carbon, to lock it away, which most of that carbon is stored actually in the soil, not in living trees, um, is a, is a function of of again the holistic health of that system. So you could have a system like that unhealthy pine stand, or like a very like a stand that was very vulnerable to catastrophic wildfire, or, you know, some of these other stands that are unhealthy for a variety of different reasons, maybe from emerald ash borer, maybe from, you know, maybe it's mostly ash and it's all being attacked by emerald ash borer, uh, where that carbon is there. And we think that by not managing it, that ultimately we will protect that carbon. But the truth is that what we really need to do to protect that carbon is to increase that forest resilience. So turning that carbon into resilient carbon because ultimately the productive capacity of that forest is nested in all these other things, in its biodiversity, in its resilience, in all these qualities that it doesn't have, like multi-generationality and species diversity, which we can promote actively. It's very like unintuitive because in some cases we need to manage that forest. In some cases we even need to, as we manage it, cause a small scale release of carbon to ultimately build the resilient carbon in that system. It's very, very strange, but um, it's something that's really interesting to talk about. But and then in most of my the management plans that I do, I'm doing forest management and I also will have a section that will be an unmanaged reserve. Again, just recognizing that uh, forest management and doing no management are not mutually exclusive. They're, they're beneficial and they're complementary and compatible. And 
Um, yeah, and, and carbon is very important to me. And then other strategies that I use for sequestering and storing lots of carbon uh, in the during the course of management is again leaving dead wood on the ground. Um, and this thing I'm really excited about, which actually didn't, it was on one of my slides, but I didn't talk about it a lot in that presentation, which is retaining these trees that we call legacy trees. So legacy trees are just trees who, if a tree has a job, the sole job of these legacy trees is to be a big tree and to be big and to get old and to eventually become a dead, a dead standing tree and to fall on the ground and be dead wood on the, on the forest floor. And we know that big trees store a lot of carbon. And they sequester a lot of carbon, right? Because again, sequestration is just the photosynthetic capacity of a tree. It, uh, it's sequestering carbon as it's photosynthesizing and those big trees have big canopies. Um, and so I think of them, you know, I'm doing this management, you know, we're cutting trees and, and at the same time, I'm promoting these attributes that are really, really important to, to both the biodiversity of that system, the wildlife habitat of that system, the resilience and the adaptability of that system you know, and then also its ability to sequester and store carbon, which is integral to the function of that system. Again, remembering to, to demystify carbon a little bit more, we sometimes talk about carbon like it's like a substance in a beaker. Carbon is wood and plant material and to a certain extent, animal material. It's living wood in living trees and it's dead wood in the soil. That's what it is. Um, and so it's, in addition to being, you know, we want to pull carbon out of the air for to mitigate climate change, and we want to store it in our forests as carbon sinks. We also are recognizing that it's also a habitat, and it also has benefits to soil hydrology, and it also is part of how we build our soil fertility. So we can't, you know, we need to think about carbon. And I, in my management plans, to get back to what I think that question was, I need to I address it ex explicitly. Um, let's see. We have a bunch of stuff in the chat too. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at yeah. <laughs> stuff in there. There's a lot of questions about deer, which is, is interesting because it's, it's hard for me to address just because at, in Vermont, we're just like right on the cusp of an unsustainable deer population. And in parts of the state, it's not a problem at all. Just colder, colder parts of the state. We have some parts of the state that are like pretty boreal. Um, but, you know, we're dealing with a, a slight deer overpopulation. So we're not at the point yet where we're fen fencing and enclosing large areas. But, um, you know, one thing that, that we are trying to do, which I think has relevance to New Jersey, this is just sort of a general deer comment that I think is really important. Um, and I think there's there's some parallels here between between logging and deer hunting. Um, I think that you know both loggers and deer hunters are really important and can play a really important role on our landscape and helping us meet our needs as far as again resilience, adaptability, et cetera, um, forest health, local renewable resources, which also can't be removed from this whole equation. I know it's easy just to talk about managing forests, but um, I think across the country, we are losing deer hunters just due to them them aging, you know, and just becoming older. And I just think it would be so exciting to think about recruiting new people to be deer hunters and to be loggers. Um, but that doesn't mean, you know, in Vermont, most people, most deer hunters who are really serious deer hunters are really focused on killing bucks. They just want to kill the biggest buck in the woods. It's exciting, you know, and they want to see more deer when they're hunting. So, so it's actually been kind of taboo to hunt does because they know that that will lower the population and they don't want to lower the population. They want to have a better time deer hunting, but unfortunately that's actually what we need to do. So I'm really interested in getting new people into deer hunting and, and trying to cultivate hunters who are not just more hunters, but who have a different ethic, who are like, the goal is not, you know, just solely kill the biggest deer. And I'm not saying that all hunters are this way. Um, the goal is not solely to kill the biggest deer. The goal is to achieve a sustainable balance of deer on the landscape, you know, and in the process, gain all these other amazing things that hunting is all about. Like you get to be out in the woods and you see all this cool stuff and you see the seasons change and you see animals and, um, and it's, it's just a really, can be a really profound, important thing, not to mention, similar to the wood thing, um, getting probably like the most sustainable source of meat that you could ever get 
from a carbon perspective or otherwise while you're solving an ecological problem. And the same thing with the loggers, you know, there are all different kinds of loggers, but I just wonder as, as they change demographically, I'd be really excited to work with loggers who are different kind, also different kinds of people and who are into it, you know, it's not just about cutting trees, but it's also about ecology. They're excited about forest ecology. They're excited about biodiversity. They, you know, they're, that's what they're, that's what they're in it for, to do that work, which is what I'm in it for. You know, I, as far as like, you know, just cutting trees for the sake of cutting trees, you know, I, I don't care about that. What I care about is protecting forests and, and having a sustainable relationship with them. Um, so interested in working with loggers like that, if you know somebody or hunters like that, if you know somebody. So Ethan, we have a pretty cool program here in New Jersey called Hunters Helping, wait a minute, Hunters Helping hung, the Hungry, where, yeah, uh, yeah it's kind of cool because they will use the deer meat and uh, feed people that may not get fed. So it's kind of cool. That's so awesome. Yeah. Cats on, you know, I, I think that you can, um, I think that you can hunt a lot more deer in New Jersey than you can in Vermont. So I could see that if we want to incentivize our best hunters to keep hunting, which we do, you know, you got to send it somewhere. And that sounds like a, a great place to send it. In Vermont, you can get maximum four a year. I don't know what our limits are. Do you know, Andy? Either Andy. Yeah, they, they, they are much more than that. Depends. I think well, Andy said they were like 20 or something. <laughs> yeah, because we, we've got uh, different seasons. We've got the, uh, the bow season, the shotgun oh. season, muzzleloader season. And the other thing is that throughout the state of New Jersey, um, there are different zones, and I guess there are probably 70 different zones. Each zone has their own restrictions on how many, I mean, there's some places you get into 100 and county and you can take as many deer as you can, you're still not gonna reduce the, the deer herd there. Other places where there aren't quite as many, it's more restrictive on what you can take. Um, they also will limit uh, how many bucks you can take versus does. Uh, some places you, you can only take two bucks, but you can take eight does. So there is a uh, an encouragement to uh, to take the does as well. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. Kill it. In, in terms of reducing population, that's that's I think one of the biggest paradigm shifts for an individual hunter. And if you're a landowner, towards getting if you're and you're concerned about deer population on your landscape, and you're talking to a hunter that you want to give permission to hunt on your land, I would say it's not just you know don't just say it's okay with me if you kill a doe. Say I would like you to target antlerless deer specifically um, to try and lower that population. It's it's just, again, it's one of these things, and I think, you know, I sort of talked about this in this presentation, but um, it's one of these things like, you know, like like cutting trees where, you know, it's, it's strange, killing deer, these beautiful animals, you know, it's strange. And, you know, we just need to sort of step into this moment where we are. And you know, recognize that just as our forests are really altered and facing all these threats and stressors and, and all of these things are, you know, we, we're sort of thru thrust into this moment that demands so much of us, demands that we do things to protect these things. Um, you know, we're also like deer, you know, we extirpated deer's natural predators and they happen to have these populations explosions that are related also to, uh, you know, deforestation and forest fragmentation and in other things, decreasing winter severity. Uh, and, you know, it's just like our job to kind of step in there and to be the predator of this animal. Mm. You know, it's as, not good as for the deer as either, you know, the overpopulation is not good for the right. species. So it's not good for anybody. And it's and it's also, you know, it's 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 yeah, it's bad for the deer themselves. And I think about it a lot because on my land, my land was um, what's called high graded. So it's when loggers visit the land, Un usually we're talking like unsupervised, unscrupulous logging, and they just cut all the biggest, healthiest trees and they leave all the less healthy trees. Um, and they cut all the big oak. And it's, it's a good oak site and that's really what should be there. And everything that's left is diseased beach. So I'm obsessed with restoring that oak component to the forest and it's really hard. And these dang deer, I'm like, I'm just trying to grow these oak trees so you can have acorns and they keep on eating them all. It's <laughs> yeah. Ridiculous. Can't wait. <laughs> Let me help you, please. <laughs> Crazy. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of questions sort of about like, um, 
like pro forestation and like you know sort of like the the anti anti forest man, management sentiment and um i think that's really important to address actively you know i think i think that that what that is in my experience and, and we just have we just have a one group pro forestation group in vermont um that we deal with you know fairly frequently and and i think it's it's important to note that um i don't think that they're wrong like I, I don't think you know they, they talk about the the importance of not managing forests from a variety of different perspectives. They talk about it from a carbon perspective. They talk about it from uh, old protecting old growth forests or letting old growth forests develop biodiversity. You know, at least in part, all of these things are true. We you know we old growth forests and unmanaged forests do usually, independent of those things I mentioned earlier about resilient carbon, old growth forests and unmanaged forests are gonna sequester and store a lot of carbon, that's true. Old growth forests are underrepresented on our landscape, that is also true. Old growth forests have unique biodiversity benefits, that is also true. I think the, the tricky thing is recognizing that, and, and I would say also that the beautiful thing is uh, that, you know, these people love forests and what's better than that, you know, and like, what's more, what's more important than the starting from such a good place. What I, what I have also found though, as I'm talking about obviously forest management, which is this really challenging and complex thing is that we just need to open ourselves up to understand a broader definition for like, again, what does it mean to love a forest at this moment in time? It is so hard because a lot of the things that we need to do to protect our forests are like so incredibly uncomfortable. And like, you know, it, we, we want to believe that if there's this tree and we love this tree and it's beautiful, that the expression of that, of compassion for this tree or the forest that it's a part of is to not cut it. And that makes all the sense in the world and it just happens, unfortunately, that because of this moment that we're in, that that isn't the solution to all of our problems at every moment and, you know, at this moment in time when we're facing all this stuff that we're facing. It's just not, but it is a part of it. So it's not that they're wrong. It's not that, you know, and I'm saying they, like I also am a, a proponent of protecting old growth forest and allowing more, more forest to be unmanaged to become old growth forest. You know, it's not that people who are advocating for that are wrong. It's thus, it's just that there are also all these other things. It's just and a again, puzzle. Yeah, it's a it's a piece of the it's a piece of the puzzle. And then we need to be, you know, like humble enough to to recognize that there are also other pieces of the puzzle that might make less sense to us, but are that are important for different reasons. Where we as a species get resources is another piece of the puzzle where how we protect species which are under threat again which are precious and which are also integral to forest function is another piece of the puzzle how we help our forests address the legacies of the past is a piece of the puzzle how we help our forests move into this completely uncertain and unknown future is another piece of the puzzle and there is no solution not forest management not no management that is going to address all of those things at once. It's going to be a lot of different things, um, you know. And and so, I, to to me, that's the really important thing. And you know, I just really think that those people who want to protect forests and who love forests—that's such an opportunity. Because then, if we can get ourselves, you know, to to have a more expansive vision of what that means and how we do that, that would be beautiful. Um, you know, and sort of just, it's not about, it's not about saying who's right and who's wrong. It's about understanding where many different things are right and wrong at the same time, or many different things are right at the same time, I should say. And I want to point out some, someone mentioned science. Um, I want to, I want to point out some resources that are really, really important, um, so uh, the first one, I think in my presentation, I called it managing forests for late successional attributes, which is what the last edition of this resource was called. The new one is called uh, Restoring Old Growth Characteristics. And that's a 2022 publication. So if you're searching, searching around, you might find the old one. And that's by 
Tony D'Amato, Dr. Anthony D'Amato, and Paul Catanzaro. That is a cool, again, a cool resource. And, and a, you know, again, another expression of like, I love old growth forests so much that I'm trying to create the attributes associated with them now. And, and I'm, you know, doing what I need to, doing what I need to do to do it, even when that makes me uncomfortable because I love trees. Um, and another one is Forest Carbon, also by Tony D'Amato and Paul Catanzaro. Another one is called Increasing Forest Resiliency for an Uncertain Future. Same authors, they're really good at making these. These are not books. These are like short, easy to understand resources on all these things um, that are super accessible, not intimidating. Um, and that's so also what I do it. is um, we uh, obviously we're recording this webinar. We actually obviously have the recording of your talk is I will send these resources as a link to yeah. an email to everybody with we pop these up on YouTube. So we're yeah. trying to actually get more um, views than you. So <laughs> we'll see if that happens. Good luck. <laughs> um, um, so I will yeah, put those resources there. Also a good chance to like, if you want to check out, I have webinar recordings and then also mm -hmm. um, I have like shorter YouTube videos, like three to five minute YouTube videos. If you want to sort of like mm -hmm. join along as we explore what it means to love a forest and all the different pieces and parts of that. Um, check out my YouTube channel. You search for Chittenden County Forester. So hopefully we can send that link out as well. Definitely, uh, definitely. And I have, a link, I have a link tree where I write these, where all my columns and story maps and YouTube channel and my email list and everything, you can find that stuff. Will do, definitely. What do you think? Should Is there another question that you think we should answer? Or should we, we call it good at that? Yeah, we're almost there. Uh, it's eight eighteen already. Andy, do you see anything in there that um, there's a a lot of praise in here, <laughs> right? Oh, <that's> <laughs> awesome. Anything, Andy? Either Andy? Um, yeah, there are a number of questions. There's a, uh, one question about uh, ash trees. Mm -hmm. As a hike in the woods, I see pockets which were once all ash trees that are now a huge area of dead and okay, fallen yeah. trees. We we, we did that one, Andy. I'm yeah, sorry? We, we covered yeah. that. One. Yeah. Yeah, I know yeah, there I was think, something in here about if there's anything for treatment of ash trees, because there is, I mean, it's pretty, yeah. and it's not like you can't stop it, right? If you're going to treat an ash tree because you want to save it, yeah, injections yeah, or can, whatever, right? Yeah, you can, I mean, we call it, in Vermont, we call it ash protection, okay. and there are, there are good ones and bad ones. Um, so there are, you want to use a non-neonicotinoid one, mm -hmm. we use one which I, I believe is the, it's called emamectin benzoate. It's a, it's a stem injection. Mm -hmm. There's another, there's another one that people use. That's like a stem soap. That's a neonicotinoid. Very, very dangerous to our pollinators. We don't use that. Yeah. Um, Neonics are going to be banned here in New Jersey. Uh, oh, good. Yeah. Uh, at, towards the end of this year, I think they're, the, yeah, the ban is going to be taking effect. Cool. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, so it won't be a problem. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's not something you, so this is, it's, you inject this chemical into the tree. It's an insecticide. It's a systemic insecticide. Um, so it's not, it's not nothing, but what it does is it protects that tree from mortality. And you, even if it's a little bit infested, you can still treat it, but then you have to treat it every two to three years forever. Um, I, we did some stem injection in forest management projects where that are not yet infested with emerald ash borer. Um, to keep trees around at just as legacy trees, again, mm -hmm. these trees that are going to stay forever, and then as seed trees, because we're actually re recognizing that we probably want to re regenerate ash, as weird as that may sound, to create some genetic variability that maybe will have resistance or to be the future generation of ash where we define some biocontrol or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so those will be the seed trees that remain. And then also on one town forest that I manage, we just there's just this really cool big ash that we named Big Jim. I don't know why it became Big Jim, but he's Big Jim. And he's got all these cool moss and lichen communities on him. And, and there's a little like area of ash around him. We treated 10 trees. And with that area, I was thinking even more about just when Emerald Ash Borer, which is not that bad here yet, sweeps through Vermont, just having a place where you can go see big living ash. Um, and that has, you know, it has cultural importance. It has mm -hmm. importance to our children and 
our communities to be able to see that tree species, which is, you know, may become very uncommon to see a, a living ash tree on our landscape, unfortunately. Yeah, I know. Well, one thing uh, oh, go ahead, Andy, you go. One of the things that's interesting is that, you know, the last 20 years or so, or longer than that, there have been a variety of different things that have come in and have, have uh, afflicted our forests. Um, the uh, woolly adelgid attacked the uh, uh, the hemlocks, and uh, like in our property, we lost all of the big hemlock trees, but now we have all these young ones popping up. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens with the ash trees. Will they come back once the ash borer is gone? Uh, I guess well, there's we think, unknowns. Yeah, we think that it might be a similar thing to like what's happening with elm. Uh, initially, what I was told even just like five years ago was that it was going to go through, it was going to kill all the ash trees, and then it was going to die because it wasn't going to have any food. And now what we're seeing is it's much more likely to be persistent on the landscape. So ash trees will get to like an infestable size and be, there'll be a lower amount of emerald ash borers around, but then they'll find those, those ash trees that are big enough to infest, infest them and they'll die. So it might not, might not go extinct, but um, probably won't, most of them will not be able to become big ash trees. That's what we think. It's a shame. I know we're- Unless we deal with it, figure out a way to deal with it. Here in New Jersey, and maybe you guys are doing it too, we have a, a wasp that they're releasing. The Department of Ag, I was just at the State Board of Ag yep. meeting yesterday. So I don't know how successful that's going to be. Let's keep our fingers crossed, but we'll and see. Eternally hopeful. Yeah, there you go. So I think we're good for the night, right? I think we answered a lot of questions and uh, just thankful that you were willing to come back. Uh, not in New Jersey, but at least part of New Jersey here. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, so, uh, uh, it was such a such a cool thing to be able to speak there and, and be able to speak with you again tonight. Excellent. Well, thank you again. Yeah, thank you very much. This has yeah. been terrific. I will get this posted up on our YouTube channel as quickly as I can. I'll get these resources out to everybody that participated tonight. And um, hopefully we'll see you guys at the next Backyard Forestry uh, in April. You're getting a lot of Claps, I say. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> we usually don't get that, okay? So <laughs> uh, that's awesome. And um, hopefully, we'll see some of some of um, the people tonight on the walks in the woods. Uh, that'll be really cool too. So thanks again. I hope everybody has a great night. Take Thank care. Thank you very much, Ethan. All right. Have a good one.